On behalf of the Czech Centre and Ton, hello and good evening from London. Uh, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us this evening uh, during the London Design Festival. Um, my name is Max Fraser and I will be hosting the talk this evening, which explores the past, present and future story of Bentwood Furniture Design and Production. The history of Bentwood Furniture is fascinating and certainly the evolution of the Tone family starting in the mid 19th century is rich and varied. And here to talk about this uh, plus present day, uh, as well as the future of uh, the Ton company is uh, Alexander Gufler, uh, who is joining us from the Ton HQ in uh, Beatrice, which I'm not saying very well. And hopefully I will improve throughout this talk. Beatrice, uh, and he can probably correct me. And, and Alexander is the- Hi Max. Uh, hello. <laughs> hi, uh, hi. Um, Alex is the creative director of Ton. Also joining us is um, Adam Stetch. He's joining us from Prague and he's the author of Plus Minus 160 Years, The Origin and Explosion of Bentwood Furniture from Bestrice. It's this fantastic Hi, book here. Uh, Adam is also a specialist in the theory of design, architecture and arts, working as an editor and curator. So hello to you both. Hi Max, hello. Uh, good, good to, to be, or oh, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, to this discussion, looking forward to it. Um, all the best to, to London Design Center, uh, Czech Center London and Czech Center Vienna as I hear to also participating. Uh, so hello from Bistrice here from the main tone headquarter um, at the whole days uh, was here because I had some meetings. So I used the, the situation and um, got into one of those old rooms um, as you see in the background maybe. Uh, Great. I mean, certainly one of the um, plus sides of travel being a little less easy is that, of course, we can uh, sure. have you in your respective countries on this call this evening, uh, not to mention uh, an audience from probably all over the world. So I did say good evening, but indeed it might be good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are <laughs> in the world. <laughs> um, I should uh, add at this point, um, if you're expecting Florian Callus of Catch, catch. He's the designer of the POV collection for Ton. Yeah, they're, they're both. There's also Sebastian Schneider, which is the, the colleague, and uh, both of them apologize very much. Uh, they have some private things going on, and sometimes, yeah, they, then the, the certain things uh, that basically you can't change. And, and so basically, I'm here, and I will switch in their role later. Okay, and, and so in a moment, we will uh, start with Alexander, who will give us a brief overview of the history of Tone and indeed Ton as it is known today. And then following him, Adam uh, will talk about his excellent book and the process of pooling together the history and stories contained within it. Um, and then following that, uh, I will ask our speakers some questions, which will last about 20 minutes. Uh, and then I will position some of your questions to them. So indeed, have a think throughout this talk and add your questions via the chat bar on the right of your screen, addressed to Renata Clark. Um, you, can, you can select her name from the um, chat options and she will pull these questions very eloquently for me so that I don't have to wade through the chat bar. Um, housekeeping rules, if you wouldn't mind, just keep your mics and cameras switched off at all times through the talk. Uh, this talk is indeed being recorded and is available to see again online after um, so, uh, less of me and more of you. Alex, yep. over to you. So, um, should I start with the... Yeah, let's bring up your uh, presentation. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, I start briefly with, with the history of, of, of the, the, this um, location here with this factory. Um, even if I'm not the, the, the biggest history expert, as I mentioned before, but briefly, I, I, I will explain a bit the situation, how it is and why it is. And, uh, so um, basically the journey of this place started in 1861 when Michel Tonet um, was looking for a place um, to build up a factory um, where we can basically um, build up his, his idea of this um, chain production. Basically, the simple pieces assembled to one chair. He was the first one thinking in this very industrial way. And so he was looking for a certain place. And here he found the Bistritze, um, which was surrounded by a beech forest, uh, 
with special beech trees that, that basically were, were uh, it's, it's the right material for bent wood. And of course, also uh, the labor costs we were good that time in this place here. Um, and the location of the place, which is still in the center of Europe. And those factors basically led him to, to um, build up the factory here. And so he established that factory. It was running and really good. Many, many chairs have been built here. So tens of millions over the time. Um, survived First World War, Second World War, and basically continued till then in the end, the Communist Party took over the Czech Republic and uh, took over the company from him uh, in, I think it was 46. And in 53, um, this became like a statal company um, and they changed the name from Tonet into uh, Ton, which in Czech means um, company for bentwood furniture. The, then, uh, yeah, and it continued to, to still continue to, to manufacture chairs, still those bamboo classics, even in this uh, communistic times, till in the 89, uh, where, where then we got over this communism time. And in, I think it was in 94, the, the company became a joint stock uh, company. Um, and from then on, um, they basically, reinvented themselves a little bit. Uh, and uh, I was exhibiting, for example, in um, 2010, my Marano chair in Cologne that time and was discovered by the former art director of Ton called Tom Kelly. And uh, yeah, I was approached by, by this company, which that time I didn't know. Um, they were telling me that they're big and in Eastern Europe and so, and uh, I decided to start a journey together with them. Uh, I, I came here, I visited the first time this company and was amazed about the size and uh, about the, the history of it. If you come here, you see the buildings and, and you smell that, that historical uh, smell, that then, then you know who are you dealing with. And so for me, it was quite exciting to start with them. And, and basically I was so the last, when we restarted was the last step uh, where Raton became again with a kind of design brand. And, uh, and from there on, uh, over the past 10 years, uh, I made a few projects with them till then in 2000, beginning uh, or end of 2019, when I then finally was asked to become the new art director of the brand and started then in, uh, the 1st uh, of January in 2020 started to, to switch in, in that role. Uh, and since then, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying somehow to, uh, to roll the company in, in, as a creative art, art, uh, director. Interesting challenge to you, Alexander, to come on board only months before a global pandemic. But um... yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought when, when, when the whole journey started. Um, it was hard. Uh, on the other hand, for me, in now later, was also kind of option because it gave us a little bit time to breathe. You know, uh, there were no fairs, there were no exhibitions, and basically give us a bit the opportunity to sit down and to really rethink again who we are, where we come from, uh, to get a bit more back into the. Oh, someone. Please uh, switch your microphones off. Thank you. Sorry, go on, Alexander. Yeah, and, and then basically, uh, so on one hand was super hard for us, uh, of course, uh, even business-wise and not knowing where it's going. But the other hand was, was again, as I said, well, was a bit of a chance for us to, 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 to think about a bit deeper. Uh, um, and for me, especially to, to figure out a bit, it's it, it's it's not that easy. It's not an easy brand to take over as an art director, I have to say. No, sure. And 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 you make your um, the story sound quite simple from exhibiting, and and I can picture the pavilion in Cologne where you have an array of young designers, essentially. Exactly. It was at that time was called the Free Contest. Um, yeah, and that was in 2010. So in that period of 10 years, you presumably learned a lot. Um, about the company to put yourself... That was my benefit then, and that's probably also um, why in the end I was asked to, to take over this role. Uh, since I was working, I'm, I'm here since 10 years, so I started to understand a bit how certain things, beside the design, 
production, uh, sales, all this marketing, all these departments works. And, and that, of course, was a huge advantage uh, for me when I started with. Yeah. And, and um, f- for the audience, could you tell us where, you're f- where you were based uh, previously? Which country? Um, I, w- I was born in Italy, so Northern Italy, Milano. So uh, it, that's my first chair called Milano because of birthplace, let's say it this way. And then I moved to Vienna for study reasons and I studied in Vienna. So I'm, I'm living, so currently I'm just here for business. I'm living in Vienna um, since um, 2003. I see. So oh, geog- almost Viennese. You've gone in a straight line geographically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And for me, yeah, being in Vienna, it's still, it's not, Bistritz is not so far. So it, it, it's it's a good spot to, to live and, and to, to work with them. Yeah. And, and for those who don't know, Bistritz is in eastern Czechia. Uh, is that right? It's Moravia. Um, uh, Czech, Czech Republic is divided into three parts, Bohemia, Moravia, and Slesia. And this is Moravia, kind of on the border with Slesia. So it's eastern part, close to Slovak Republic. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and Adam, while you're, uh, while you're here, why don't you um, talk us through uh, this fantastic book you've worked on, which I've really enjoyed reading over the last few days. Um, it's, a, it's a really a great book. Uh, I, I take my hat off to the amount of work. I know how much work goes into a book like this. Talk us through that book and what it was like to compile it from your side. Can we have uh, first of all, first of all, thank you to to Czech Center. Thank you to Max uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's very flattering uh, to me uh, that you are saying this because I, I also know know your work since maybe twelve years. And I, will, I have been following uh, your curatorial and also editor, uh, editorial work. So uh, it's very uh, good for me to be here with you now today and <laughs> all of you, uh, also with Alex. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I, I work as an independent curator and researcher. I teach design history and architecture history. I write articles. I, I do... Uh, many creative uh, projects uh, with uh, design, uh, also with contemporary design. But uh, for me, the most exciting period is the 20th century, which I think it's the, let's say, golden age of, of design and the, and, and the evolution of industry itself uh, and the furniture design. And so for me, this was very amazing opportunity to, to study more closely uh, the design history, which basically is um, the beginning of, of our modern approach to production of furniture and industrial goods, because, um, uh, because uh, Michael Tonet, uh, he, he founded this uh, company uh, at the really beginnings of, of modern age, basically. And for me, uh, it was really nice uh, to uh, basically understand finally or uh, to, to get to know this exciting uh, history, which is uh, very much connected to my country because uh, during, the, uh, during my maybe 15 years uh, of research of design, I was always more interested in uh, architecture and design from Italy or from France or from USA. And I was really uh, quite a lot of traveling and so on. And uh, this was the opportunity to really uh, go back to the roots, let's say, uh, of, my, uh, of my country also and of my culture. And uh, it was quite funny that it happened basically during the pandemic because uh, I did this book uh, whole year of 2020 and uh, I had time to go to Bistrice to, to, to look at the archive uh, of, of, uh, of the company, to, to visit many people who were involved uh, with, the, with the Tong company, who are not just designers or uh, directors of these companies, but of this company, but also uh, also collectors or other researchers uh, who know much much more than me about history of tone because it's so complex mm-hmm. and so difficult to tell 
uh, in a short book, let's say, or, or uh, let's say a book which also uh, should be understood by, by people who are not really involved in the history of design. Uh, but this history, it's uh, very, very dramatic, let's say, and mm -hmm. it um, completely illustrates uh, the, the history of uh, the 20th century itself uh, with all the uh, politics, politician or politics systems and, and the wars and, and so on, as uh, actually Alex uh, uh, told about it, that the company went through the all uh, re regime uh, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire to the first Republic of Czechoslovakia, like a democratic Republic, uh, through the Second World War, uh, through the communism and back again to the democracy after the Velvet Revolution in 1989. So, um, so I decided to to um, to create somehow the, the the chronological narrative because it's basically most basic, let's say, uh, but probably the most understandable. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to tell. Uh, very long stories, really long texts about how uh, all the uh, or the company evolved or developed. But I rather choose, uh, let's say, different and little stories which are, let's say, in between uh, those those big changes. And these little stories, uh, from many kind of perspectives. Uh, they, they illustrate the, the history of Ton and the history uh, of the uh, basically modern furniture at all. So uh, this was really nice and uh, we, we collaborated with photographers. We did many, uh, let's say, interviews uh, also with the, with the workers, with the, with, the, with the workers of the company who, who have worked for this company in the 60s or 70s. Uh, they were basically whole families uh, employed uh, in this company, uh, like father, mom, uh, son and daughter, all of them, for example, there were some cases, they worked for this company. So it's pretty much uh, really influential for the region uh, on one side, but also on the completely global scale because mm -hmm. uh, Ton Company or Tonet respectively, was the first really mass, produ mass production of furniture design. And uh, what I seen in, in the archive, there are amazing uh, um, photos or, or illustrations of old, for example, all just um, on um, uh, old camp, uh, factories. Mm -hmm. They were not just in Bystrice. Bystrice was just one, camp one factory from maybe 10 or 15 other huge factories spread around the central Europe. And, um, uh, but also the showrooms, the, the amazing uh, projects, which already in the maybe uh, 1895, this company uh, produced and exported really the, the millions, the thousands of of uh, hundreds of thousands to millions chairs worldwide. So it's quite amazing to see that even like 100 years before and more, uh, there was such a company which was so modern and so mm -hmm. influential and had impact on basically how we sit uh, in general today. So uh, this was challenging and I approached this topic uh, as I always like to approach the design history, uh, let's say in more uh, entertaining way, more, um, more um, um, understandable by the public, uh, because I'm not really like academic, academic curator. Uh, I like to work uh, and I like to spread the information in a nice way, in an understandable way. Uh, to the uh, large audience, to the wide audience. And I hope uh, this, uh, we, we succeed with the book. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy because I have really good, uh, really good um, um, 
reaction on the book and probably the most uh, most the best uh, reaction for me was from um, from Alexander von Fegesack, who is one of the co-founders of the design museum, Vitra Design Museum in Weil am Rhein. And we have interviewed him for the book because he, he is one of the biggest collector of Tonnet and he, he made a lot of books uh, on the Benthood furniture. And he replied me with very nice email that he is very happy from, let's say, new uh, approach to uh, Bentwood furniture history. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this was really nice and I'm very happy. So uh, this is kind of uh, in short, uh, the story of the book. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that struck me reading the book was how a company with such history, you know, you could get really bogged down in a, in a lot of weight and sure. of that history, but actually you've picked up on, on the, the major stuff uh, I learned a lot from it without, um, you know, getting too uh, overwhelmed, and and also really loved um, some of those stories, those interviews you did that you mentioned, uh, particularly with some of the people who worked in the factory. You know, and you read the interview and you realise that their grandmother, their grandfather, their uncle, their aunt, <laughs> you name it, all worked uh, at some point or other in in these factories. So so they were such an important part of the culture of 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 that part of the country. Uh, and, and then I was also reflecting on this, um, on the fact that actually, you know, Bentwood furniture uh, is such an established part of the furniture vernacular. You know, when I was at school, I sat on, on the series um, 14 uh, in my assembly. Um, it, you know, it's, it was part of, it was just part of life. Um, and, and, and in case any of us take Bentwood furniture uh, for granted, perhaps you could explain how and where the technique was discovered in the first place and, and then indeed how Michael or Mikel Tone industrialized it. Maybe that's a question for you, Adam. Yes, uh, uh, the Bentwood furniture, the, the, the technique itself was even invented before Tonnet. Uh, yeah. we, know, we know some furniture from USA, from UK, which were already manufactured this way. But all this furniture was more or less like experiments. Uh, okay. Nobody was able uh, before Michal Tonet to manufacture it in a bigger scale. And this was the, I think the, the, the biggest ground, uh, like the most groundbreaking moment uh, of, of Tonet uh, genius because uh, first he, he, was a, he was a carpenter in, in Germany and uh, he, he made already some experiments in the, in the 30s and in the 40s uh, of the 19th century. And then uh, there was this uh, uh, kind of uh, show uh, of, uh, of, the, of the products, uh, industrial products. And actually Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, some, some, some guys from them, they saw uh, Michael Tonnet's uh, furniture and they invited him to uh, go to the Vienna. Uh, and they, 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 um, they made a kind of a deal uh, that he was, uh, he, he, was, uh, he, could, um, he was free of, uh, of some, um, like a VAT or, uh, or these, these things. And he could, he could just experiment in Vienna. He had good... Uh, environment there, good clients, and uh, and then uh, in two thousand, uh, sorry, uh, eighteen fifty three, uh, he he founded his first big bigger scale factory, and it was um, um, it was very close to to Bistrice, uh, in Koricani. Uh, it was the first uh, Tonnet factory. And uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, this was a really good location because, uh, yeah, the, 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 um, there was quite, quite poor region uh, where uh, he could pay le le um, lesser amount of salary uh, to the workers. There was uh, amazing environment for, uh, for the um, uh, trees uh, he, he used. Uh, and it was also... Uh, in terms of connection with the train, already there was a train. Uh, there was Ostrava, uh, 
right very close to Bystrice and and this this region, uh, which was already at the time quite a huge industrial center with the coal mining, and so this was the perfect location, and uh, yeah, and Tonet started this uh, evolution of of uh, these bentwood experiments into really the production of big scale. Uh, but it wasn't just a design and the construction methods and, the, and the, the fabrication itself, which allowed him to do really huge factory. He was also very good business minded uh, guy, also with his sons. That's that actually he had five sons. And, um, and uh, that's why the company is called Gebrider Tonet, the, not Ton, but the the company which is still in in Vienna so it's it's called after his sons and and they really were skillful in establishing a network uh, of uh, of shops uh, of dealers and uh, already in the 19th century uh, they 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 supplied the furniture for the most prestigious uh, buildings and sites in the world, like Yale University in USA, uh, or or huge theaters in uh, I don't know Buenos Aires and uh, and uh, Brazil and uh, Paris and everywhere. So and they also exhibited uh, their products on the huge international world fairs which always got some new medals and so on. So so whole business model was kind of from scratch. And I think, or I have a, it's my, uh, it's my uh, idea or um, my feeling that basically Michael Tonet founded uh, the modern uh, furniture trade, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a fantastic um, legacy for him. Um, and, and certainly, I think prior to turning the process industrial furniture, if I'm right in saying, was always commissioned sort of bespoke. It was predominantly made out of timber. You'd go to yes. a carpenter, you'd ask for whatever you want. And uh, it was a, a, a slow process. And then, of course, if we then fast forward to the successful industrialization of, of the production of the chair number 14, the, the kind of all time classic embodiment of, of, of um, Bentwood chairs, uh, which has now been produced in, in really tens of millions of times. Uh, and at one point was made from six pieces of Bentwood, eight screws and two bolts. So it was a sort of modern day Ikea of that time, um, albeit uh, um, with, with very high quality to go with it. Do, do you think that chair, the chair number 14, uh, was indeed the beginning of affordable mass produced furniture? Um, Alex. Yeah, sure, hundred uh, percent. It's basically if if you build chairs and if you ever built a chair. Hello, Max. Uh, we hear you. Still. Okay. I hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I couldn't see Max. Uh, anyway, I continue. Um, It was it was super important uh, step step for this kind of uh, production since since you have those single parts and it's much easier if, if you have specialized workers uh, working on each on each part uh, uh, and then afterwards you just connect them and that is this is ingenious in that otherwise you you always have one worker working on one entire chair uh, and the, what what makes things much complicated. Uh, in terms of assemblage, gluing, so e e even this uh, this assembly with screw ha has a certain sense, since bentwood is, is, has always the tendency to lose a bit the form. It, it's never like always exactly the same. It, it's like uh, a flexible thing, and and therefore to have really uh, like nowadays in some solid wood furniture have these milled uh, wooden connections. That's that's quite tricky to apply on on bentwood furniture because of course uh, all machinery to hit always the same spot it's difficult if, if the bended part is also a bit different and therefore though this crew connection is fantastic and then coming to to step further it's also fun, it, it was also very ingenious from logistic logistic point of view uh, since. Uh, we heard from Adam that that uh, basically so many chairs were built and also exported and uh, brought uh, 
to, to several countries, it was easier to, to, to send some parts somewhere and, and assemble it there instead of sending the whole chairs through the world. Fortunately, this has become a bit uh, more difficult nowadays uh, due to all these tests and everything. Uh, uh, it's, it's not that easy anymore, unfortunately. So, so now you can't, you can't uh, send uh, chair number 14 disassembled to the... It depends, no, it's, 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 it's not, let's say it this way, it's not so easy to assemble it. And uh, so um, you need skilled people in the end. So basically you need to build up, you, you could send it disassembled to another country, but then you need another tone team there to reassemble it. Maybe you, you have to... to yeah, to think it over again in a, in a modern way, to find modern, more modern ways to connect it. Uh, but again, coming back to this flexibility of band wood that makes it also a bit tricky to assemble it. Our people here are super skilled, so they have all their forms and, and uh, helpers to assemble everything. Um, but yeah. Okay, where is Max? <laughs> I don't know. No. So Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, th th this was uh, my fas fascination when I was uh, at the um, at the um, museum or the collection of of Alexander von Fegesack yep. in mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. and uh, he had so many uh, promotion materials uh, from from a uh, Tonnet history. Uh, basically, all designed in amazing Art Nouveau graphic mm -hmm. design, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were like like catalogs which were so huge. Uh, it's unbelievable how uh, already, for example, in 1900, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, you had you had a catalog which had maybe uh, 300 pages uh, with. Uh, Hundreds of products. Hundreds. But the good, of the good thing on this kind of furniture is, since it's like simple, simple, uh, different simple parts that you basically assemble by screws, that certain parts you can use on another chair. So basically, it's like it's like a bit of Lego system where where you can connect different parts yeah. and create a new chair out of it. And that that, that was the reason why they had this huge catalog in the end. Uh, by using this backrest on this seat with those legs, and and yeah, that so was also the, the, the genius on 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 this kind of furniture. Uh, yeah, so many variations of, of the products. It's, it's unbelievable. And all the catalogs are beautiful drawn, all the models, all the details in uh, beautiful drawings, uh, later the photographs. And uh, it's, it's really, really nice. Uh, but maybe back to, to, uh, to the uh, chair number uh, 14, mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, it's such an icon of, of design history. I, I think uh, I have uh, here uh, the big atlas of, uh, of chairs yeah. or of furniture, yeah. which was just published by Vitra Design Museum. And there are four chairs on the cover of this, uh, of this huge book. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the chairs, it's actually uh, chair number fourteen. Because so uh, it it defined the 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 design history, the furniture history. And last uh, last uh, my idea, um, I think that uh, the designers of modern era, like I mean Bauhaus and mm -hmm. the Bauhaus designers mm -hmm. and the tubular steel uh, furniture designers. Uh, they basically uh, they did the same what Michael Tonnet did already uh, 100 years ago, basically mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. ago before them, uh, but they just used new material, so mm -hmm. it's quite it's quite interesting. But it's funny because that this kind of this way of building furniture somehow then it got lost somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, getting again more t t t tricky, tricky uh, wooden connections, mill, CNC mill stuff. So this whole logic somehow was still on those classic pieces. Mm -hmm. So, but um, there were not many modern designers in the end. Uh, it's true. 
working on this. Uh, when, when I started, so this was the time where, okay, visible screws, they're ugly, you don't want to see them. So it's better to have like a wooden connection. But now after, if you get more and more emerged in all this, then you understand more and more the geniosity and you start to like those screws again because they make so much sense. Uh, so, um, sorry, if there's any proof that maybe uh, two uh, talented individuals don't need a chair of a talk, that was it. I'm sorry if you lost me for a moment. <laughs> no, no, we missed you already. Very strange, you had a two-second power failure that cut everything out. Don't worry. The internet. So, um, anyway, I'm, I'm now on a hotspot through my phone, but I hope you can see me. In okay, the that's, it's, it's working perfectly. So, Apologies, I don't know what was said in those last few few minutes, but perhaps we. We can... were talking a bit like still about the, the question uh, about chair number fourteen and number 14. The, 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 the geniosity about that way of uh, build up chairs or construct chairs uh, in many different aspects, uh, from production to logistics to transport. Uh, yeah. To like being a bit a Lego system. To where you build up basically different chairs from different parts. And, and I wanted to ask you about um, Bentwood Furniture and how ubiquitous it is in Czech homes. I mean, it, uh, uh, many of the pieces that we see from the collection are, are timeless, but of course there have been periods in the history of the company when the popularity of these styles of furniture may have uh, peaked or, or waned. Um, what, what's it like today in the Czech Republic, in, in, in Czechia? Do you see, do you see a lot of... Um, Bentwood furniture still? Uh, I mean, of course, uh, you can see them in cafes or uh, still the, these classics, ju not, not just number 14, but, yeah. but uh, also the, the other models from, from that era. 20, uh, 30. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, they are in, in homes of people, but uh, I think they are so already uh, so normal for that, people. Uh, yeah, I would... it's, so, it's so like an archetype of furniture. That it disappears and, somehow. Yes, yes. It disappears and the people, uh, they don't know that this chair is so ingenious or mm -hmm. so so groundbreaking or a masterpiece of design mm -hmm. uh, they just have it they they call it tonetka mm -hmm. uh, most people in czech tonetka i have tonetka uh, that's the that's the slang for for tonet chairs and we even had some at at, at my home when i grew up i we, we had some uh, tonet uh, ton ton chairs uh, because they were still produced uh, during the during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and also like generation of my parents, uh, they bought them and uh, mm -hmm. they they had they had them, and uh, of course um, there was this uh, kind of quite big interest of collectors, which was mostly in the 80s and the 90s to collect the, the really vintage ones, the sure. really old ones. Mm -hmm. and, but now I think the interest of collectors is a little bit, was moved to, to more modernism and, and, and other, other things. Uh, but I think young, young generation again starts to rediscover that this kind of furniture. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because of course we're talking a lot about we're talking exclusively about Bentwood furniture until now, but the interwar years saw the introduction of tubular steel furniture. Uh, and, and so how did, uh, how did Thonne uh, embrace this uh, as a, was it a potential threat or did they, um, was it embraced by the company? No, it was totally embraced. Like uh, Tonnet uh, at this time, it's for me as a researcher was the most difficult part actually of the interwar period. Because Tonnet uh, merged with other companies to create the biggest uh, conglomerate of furniture companies in the world in the 20s and the 30s. And it was called Tonnet Mundus. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like really huge uh, financial group, basically, merging all the furniture, all these Bentwood companies and so on. And the, the factory in, uh, in Frankenburg, in, in, um, in Germany, uh, they, they, they produced even the, the steel furniture, the tubular steel. 
And uh, when you flip through the catalogs of Tonet Mundus company in the 30s, uh, you have a lot of uh, actually modernist furniture. They even had licenses to produce uh, some Le Corbusier and Charlotte Perriand's designs. Uh -huh. uh, they had a license for Marcel Breuer and also some other designers, for, uh, like also the Vienna designers, like uh, Josef Frank or uh, Josef Hoffmann. They designed uh, furniture for them in the 30s, not from steel, but from the, from the uh, classic band, the band group. Uh, but uh, they were very modern. They, they looked like almost like some Alvar Alto designs a little mm -hmm. bit and so on. So, of course, the company in those times, they, they innovated. And um, until today, the, the German Tonnet, uh, the company, uh, they, they still produced the, the tubular steel classics. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, within the history of the company, um, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk in 1946, um, the company changed and was taken over by national rule uh, through the communist period and um, sort of the complete antidote to the kind of capitalist and entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit of, of Michael Tonnet back at the beginning. And how did the, um, how did the company shift during that period? And, what, and, then, and then indeed, what were some of the, some of the challenges post 1989 when the company became privately owned again? That's, that's for either of you to answer. So maybe I will. I will. I think uh, Adam tell, is more skilled in this. <laughs> I will tell something about this socialist period, and maybe yeah. uh, then then Alex can add something after the Velvet Revolution. Uh, I think uh, it shifted uh, completely as the whole political system in Czechoslovakia at the time. Uh, of course, everything was nationalized. Uh, the the tonnet uh, was left uh, out. Uh, the, 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 the company was uh, renamed to uh, Továrny ohýbaného nábytku, which means ton, which, may, which is the factory for bentwood furniture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it still produced, of course, um, and it, uh, they, they still produced um, the, the classic models, and they also uh, started to invent some new ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the, the quality of the production uh, was, um, was uh, worse mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Uh, but for example, in the, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, some very interesting architects, uh, Czech architects, they, they collaborated with Ton. And they created some amazing designs, uh, which I think are still pretty timeless. Uh, some of them were produced, uh, some of them were exhibited worldwide on exhibitions, uh, also in the, in the Western uh, world. Uh, and a um, uh, lot of these chairs we have still at home. The like mm -hmm. Czech people, they have mm -hmm. still the, at, at mm -hmm. home. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there was huge amount of designs which were never realized, which, which uh, were just on the paper. Uh, uh, actually, now we are preparing a little show which will be in Prague uh, in uh, our gallery uh, together with Ton, which will be about these uh, amazing hand draw uh, sketches and drawings and the technical uh, drawings of furniture, which Ton uh, still has uh, in his in its archive, and they are amazing designs, really beautiful modernist chairs uh, compared to Scandinavian design at the time and so on. But of course, how uh, was uh, basically usually during the socialist period, uh, the, the companies were completely lost in the, in the competition with, mm -hmm. with, other mm -hmm. in, with other countries and so on. And it kind of went from uh, basically one to zero a little bit in, in this whole socialist system of directing the company and so on uh, yeah and then then the velvet revolution came and and ton became again let's say the, the the private company and i have to agree with adam because 
just last week I was also down in the archives and uh, checked some old rooms full of old chairs like and and what you see there you can't even imagine like uh, how great designs how great drawings all to see all that heritage which brings me to the point um, that after communism, and that, that's a bit a pity that, that uh, this generation who suffered under communism or lived under communism somehow uh, didn't want to watch back in that time. And, and so basically ton somehow restarted with not considering all this, this great stuff hidden in the archives uh, because it was communistic and, and they didn't want to get back to those communist times. And, and so they got lost a bit. And, and now I see even here uh, in the factory, the young generation really starts to get interested in this. And, and uh, yeah, again, what I say, uh, I saw some, some fantastic stuff over in the last week. And as an art director, of course, it's, 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 it's nice to know that, that um, there's a lot of material around uh, to work with sooner or later. And that, and that brings us into the present day. So perhaps you could just paint the picture of um, Bistrice as, mm -hmm. as a town today and, and equally um, how within the, within the factory has the Bentwood production process changed from the days of steam and muscle. <laughs> Well, uh, not at all. <laughs> the process uh, it depends on what kind of bandwidth we are talking about. So if you really go back to this number 14 backrest, so this is all three-dimensional shaped. And uh, there's basically, there's no machine that can make that. Uh, not No robot, no anything. Since this is a very delicate process, every stick of wood is a bit different. There are some defects inside. So it's a super, super tricky process from the selection of the wood itself uh, up to the whole steaming process and the bending process. It's like, if, if you see how the bend, it's always a team of two guys bending one backrest. It's like a ballet in the end, what they're doing. Uh, and it's always just those two guys can work with each other. They, they can't, if so, one is sick, even the other one will cannot collaborate with the guy from the other team. So you see, it's, 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 it's a super tricky um, technique. But in the meanwhile, like in the 60s, uh, here at Tom, um, they developed some machines for more simple parts like those wooden rings. And so these are like real machines built in-house and uh, where we still are using, um, where basically one worker puts one beam of steam wood in that machine and the machine really uh, wraps that wooden piece up to, to a ring and then the ring gets closed mm -hmm. in a form and starts to dry. So that's the, the semi machine process. And then you have the most modern now is the high frequency bending, but therefore you just can do like simple bands like for some front legs and so simple two dimensional bands where basically in one form, you can put like 20 sticks of wood inside, the form closes, and then it's like a bit like a microwave oven where some microwave get inside the wood, the water in the wood, because wood has always a certain percentage of moisture, starts to cook and, and basically uh, activates the same process as in the steam oven. And so that's the more modern way to do it. But those really nice bended backrests, they're still, uh, handmade and right. what brings me to the point to, to also to explain a little bit that because people always think yeah you should more do more band food more band food more band food which would be fantastic to do but since as a company when it's it's nowadays it's not that easy to find people uh, working eight hours next to a steam oven uh, doing like this this super hard labor job you need someone who really likes to do it and is proud of what he's doing and so somehow since we're a big company we always have to find the right mix between bentwood furniture and also another direction what we are working since since a long time is, is the plywood that's also part of the tone history uh, mm -hmm. which is a huge part also what people sometimes forget about and and so basically it's it's, it's a bit to find the right mixture uh, not to exaggerate the bandwood thing because uh, there certainly you reach the, the limits till maybe one day robots will be that sensitive to do it but uh, that will take a bit of a while. So let's let's talk about um, a, a current collection then the, the POV collection if we could bring yeah. up the images of that please that was designed by uh, the Ka Cash Cash, Cash, Cash. Um, studio and um, 
tell us a bit about this and then and, and indeed what, what is it that you're looking for in in an external so designer? basically this is a kind of typology uh i want always wanted to do as a designer uh, already because i like it simplicity if you, if you do tables chairs um sooner or later you realize it's always a lot of legs going on and this is what i like on the center column pieces uh that they bring a certain calm in, in the whole setup and uh and so, uh, yeah, basically when I started my job as an art direction, Florian and Sebastian were one of the first one approaching me or approaching Tone for a kind of collaboration. And the, and the nice thing was that I knew both guys already a few years ago. So we saw each other on fairs, so we knew, knew each other. And when they approached us, uh, I had this, this kind of, of project inside my head. And, and basically, uh, I started the topic with them if they would like to be interested in working on, on a table with this center column. And they agreed, so so step by step, we started to, to or they started to develop um, an idea for, for this product, which in my opinion, that was another aim, was always to, to really uh, make not just one table, but to make a huge series out of it. Really something that works in a private home, in, in an office, uh, to build a, a huge program out of it and, and therefore from beginning if you start to design something from from the beginning you have to consider all those aspects so it means huge program it's very helpful if you have less parts as possible and what led us or them to, to, to this conical shape where in the end all these tables are made out of two molds two plywood molds and that's it so uh Basically, it's the conical mold, the plywood gets in, it gets pressed, and then it depends if you take the lower part or the higher part, brings you to the bigger cone or the smaller cone for the smaller base. And also the, the, the shape, what the, what, the, uh, what the guys choose, this triangular shape that in the end also led that in the name uh, POV, was, quite, was something surprising for us because in the end, you're very used to very symmetric shapes. And this triangular shapes brings a bit of distortion when you walk around and brings a bit uh, something new, fresh uh, uh, in, 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 into this world. And, and that was basically the thing that attracted me and where we, we all here in Tone were sure that this is uh, can become a, a successful product for us. And so over, over one year, it was really tough to job for them. Uh, to specify everything. So you have like three different shape of tabletops. Uh, you have three different uh, edges on, on the tabletops. Uh, you have the small bases, the long bases, the stools. Uh, but in the end, that, that ended up in, in that huge program, uh, table program that where we see now, uh, it's very appreciated because it shows a certain strength of the product also, a certain commitment from our side and uh, and nice thing is it fits to all of our chairs it works with the classics it works with the plywood chairs uh, so in the end it was a very successful collaboration between Tone and the studio Kashkash. yeah um i'm conscious we've been talking for quite a long time I've, i see the the time now and i'd like the audience to have an opportunity to ask mm -hmm, a question sure. I'm going to read some out here um uh Let's have a look here. How, how do you, this one's coming from Renata. How do you select the designers that you work with? You have a dream designer that you'd like to work with. Uh, no, here I don't want to put some names in the room, but there are, certainly there are, there are some. What, are uh, what, what, is the, what is the DNA or the, the, the attributes you're looking for? Basically, since I always say it's like, uh, when you start to work with a designer due to it's also the, the the, the way you sign a contract and it's valid for a lifetime. So it's very important, in my opinion, that that personally recite the skills uh, uh, of, of that person, but, but that personally also that, that you have a good, that the chemistry is working well between designer and company. Because it's a long, tough process. It's a lot of things not going, compromises from both sides. So it's, it's a bit of a tennis match, you know, back and forward, back and forward. And you want someone who, who who understands that and who understands this. since everything is difficult, you don't want to have like someone who, who is really stressy that the whole 
every, everyone is trying their best, but uh, it's, it's not that simple as it seems sometimes. And uh, of course, then I, t- I know a lot of designers. I get a lot of designs in. I have to pre-select, select. Uh, of course, I check their work, check their reputations, I look for who they were working with uh, to understand a little bit, big brands, not big brands, can they... And then in the end, it, it's it's very important to, to that was a bit of the tricky part in the COVID times, but it, it's very important to meet personally, to bring them here uh, to the factory, to show the factory, to get uh, in touch with, with the, the, the according people here from production, product development, marketing, and and then, then you feel somehow. Uh, and then in the end, yeah, it's it's a it's a start of a process where you never know where you end up. There's never a guarantee. So even if you select one of those top designers, you never know what you're gonna get. And so, so yeah. I mean, certainly visiting a factory, I've always noticed when a designer goes to a factory, their eyes are like popping yeah, out. Yeah, sure. Of and head. seeing this this monster here, it's you. You can't even imagine how those eyes just uh, yeah. are shining when they're walking through this one yeah. here. Uh, and, and of course, the great honor of working in the in the in the line of of history of the company as well. Sure, sure, and, sure. And just in um, Adam, if I could bounce over to you with a question from Lenka. Um, which story was the most interesting once you were working on the book? What's it, was there a, a story that personally uh, you, you loved or were fascinated by? Uh, I was really uh, fascinated by the special thing which is in the book. Uh, we photographed the very unique um, kind of a box which was very ornate, very, uh, it was I don't know from which year, but but it was the box which uh, August Tonnet, one of the one of the sons of of Michael Tonnet, uh, received for for his birthday, and it is uh, it was the complete collection of uh, lithographs or like uh, drawings with yes exactly this. Uh, very very beautiful case and inside you have maybe 30 or 40 uh, like uh, um, papers beautiful drawings with all the uh, uh, signatures of uh, employees of the whole tonic company of course not all of them but the let's Mm -hmm. say probably management and important ones but every single paper was from one factory or from one shop which was already in the portfolio uh, of tonnet company so you have a uh, like congratulation from the new york store or from london mm-hmm. store from paris store uh, from Korichani uh, factory and so on. So this was really beautiful object we found in in the Tonet archive. Uh, but uh, if but this is it's very little story. There is a very little text about this thing. But if I could choose the the really the story, uh, so it was the visit of Alexander von Fegesack. I already mentioned him because this guy really knows so much about the history of Tonnet. And uh, I visited him in bois in, in France, where, where he has his uh, collection and, uh, and uh, basically kind of a design um, camp on the, on the castle. And uh, so it was amazing like, to be there three days and just to talk to him about the history of company and to uh, look at all the different books and uh, catalogs and vintage materials he has also in this, in this uh, collection. So it was a quite big help for me to fully understand or fully uh, somehow understand the, the history of Tonnet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm getting several questions from somebody that goes by um, FB so I don't know who you are FB um, but you um, a question here you, you've mentioned that the local forest was one of the reasons why the factory was established in Bistrice. Um is the local wood still the main resource for producing ton furniture and yes. um, that's 
a question for, for you, Alex. Yeah, it's it's basically we try to get the wood here from the area, but also for the farthest away, I think it's Slovakia where we're getting. So still, still from the surroundings here, because it's also we need beech wood and we need a special type of beech wood, which basically forces us more or less to get. And it's all certificated wood. That means tree gets removed, new one gets planted. So uh, here we're really trying to be as eco-friendly as possible. Um, but on the other hand, also, um, we are very concerned to produce really uh, long-standing furniture, which means uh, furniture that lasts for for lifetime and not uh, this, we completely try to do the opposite as this buying, throwing away, buying, throwing away. Um, so therefore we are really concerned to, to deliver uh, the quality needed to, to have uh, really good look. And, and this is what we think, this is uh, this combined with our policy of buying wood, uh, you get a quite a good eco-friendly product. Yeah. Uh, another question, someone uh, by the name of Daniela, she asks, um, does Ton work only with bigger names in design or is it possible that Ton would work with younger designers or even students? It's, it's not about the name in general. Uh, it's as I said, there's so many factors. Uh, you need to also to get the right design to the right time. You know, I mean, to be honest, you get to almost 10, 20 designs in every day. Right. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a big filtering job for you. So it's it's it's, it's really hard then to select or not select, and, and then in the end, yeah, it's it's. As I say, as a designer, it's a bit, it's a bit a lucky thing. It's, it's, uh, you need to be there at the right time. To, it's like a bit music, you know. You can be a super good band playing in your garage, but maybe you never end up at a big major label. Someone else does. So, and it's. Or you could exhibit a D three in Cologne, and ten years later. Of course, would... that's a help. Yeah, that that's of course a help. Or visiting us at the booth, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a question about if there will be or when will there be an exhibition in London, maybe of the, of the history of the company, or indeed anywhere else, not necessarily London, ideally London. Uh, it's for me or for Alex? No, no, either of you. <laughs> any, any talk uh, about an exhibition? Um, no, basically, anyway, we will uh, build up a showroom in London soon, let's hope, COVID time basically uh, forced us to, to postpone that, that whole journey. Uh, but on your case, is coming up strong and uh, we will see us soon in, in London uh, showroom, let's hope. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of time and I just wanted to take a, a little moment to nod to the future uh, and ask you both um, what the future of um, Bentwood furniture is. What are your thoughts? I think we'll be always a part as long as long as we find people to bend it. Uh, it will be also always a part uh, of furniture business. Um, but again, it, it, it's, it's so special to make it. Uh, um, I'm not sure if it will have the, the biggest renaissance ever and, and getting it back to those sizes that it has been. But that's basically my opinion. It's it's a labor, it's, it's a labor thing. Uh, but but the people like it. They have it so much in their DNA. And since Bentwood is always banded curves and and uh, so so. Yeah. So so that's interesting. You mentioned labor as being a difficulty. Is that is that something you're experiencing now to to find enough people? Yeah. To yeah. Uh, of course. I mean, as I said, it's a tough, tough work, and I uh, have highest respect. So since I was had the pleasure to bend those backrests, sometimes uh, <laughs> uh, I know what I'm talking about, and I'm quite skilled craftsman. But uh, they're really, uh, I got really humbled then after that. Uh, well, if any the, anyone in the audience fancies flexing their muscles, it sounds like there's jobs going in uh, Bistrice. So yeah, if he wants to move to Bistrice, then then he's really <laughs> appreciate everyone uh, coming here. Adam, do you want to um, come back with your response? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear your uh, your uh, question because I had some little bit connection lost. 
Ah, okay. It was looking at the future of, of Bentwood Furniture. What what are your thoughts on where the future of it, of it of, of, as a as a material and a skill might be heading? Um, I think we we seen uh, one hundred and sixty years of Bentwood Furniture, and not so much changed actually from mm -hmm. the beginning to today. So I hope that uh, we will have another maybe two hundred years. Uh, of Bentwood furniture, I think it will be still part of the uh, of the, our world of our interiors. I think it's so well integrated, um, probably much more than than other uh, furniture experiments and groundbreaking yeah. uh, technologies like uh, steel furniture or plastic furniture. I think this is kind of still even today the archetype of chair is Bentwood chair. And uh, I think with the uh, work of Ton and uh, young designers and, um, and also, also new designs is uh, beautiful to cherish this, sure. tra this, this tradition. Because and, of course, yep. and I have, to, I have to say that I'm really happy that uh, Alexander is at the helm of Ton because I think it's again, this connection of Czech and Austria, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was the basically the, the, the background for all the uh, Tonnet history, uh, how it started. It started in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire when uh, Czech and Austria were one country. And I think this is quite symbolic that uh, Ton started to collaborate again with the Vienna-based designer uh, and uh, I think it's very symbolic, very nice. And uh, it's not just about the furniture, it's about connecting people. Uh, it's about uh, discussion, it's about freedom. And I think uh, that's, that's the perfect uh, situation now for Ton. And I'm very happy that Adam made that book because that, that basically started again also with the process of, you know, getting back to the archives. Uh, um, and uh, what's really for me now, it's like really uh, a huge help in, in the whole process. And uh, again, everyone is excited now okay, to, to see those things uh, again. And, and yeah, will will help us for the future for this brand. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased to, to be in this position and uh, to be part of the history of this brand. Since There's a, there's a lot of love for, it, for, it, for each other in this <laughs> side of the room. I'm appreciating that right now. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there are other questions from the audience, uh, but I think we're out of time. Um, if anyone would like, of course, to learn more about um, TON, uh, do check out the website, ton.eu. Mm -hmm. uh, also on the same website, you'll find information about the book uh, and you can buy the book through, um, through the website link. Uh, of course, if you're physically in London, uh, TON products, so currently available via the Ton UK team in, in Wenlock Road, but uh, there is intention uh, to open a trade show room in London within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to say uh, thank you all as the audience for joining us this evening. Uh, of course, thank you to Alex and Adam for um, sharing their knowledge uh, with thank us. Thanks from my and, side. And, so and, and, thank you, and Max. Thank you, Adam. And, and the team at the Czech Centre and Tom for, Tom for organising this and, and dealing with the uh, technicalities behind the scene. Again, I apologise for ducking out for a few minutes halfway through. That was genuinely an electrical fault. <laughs> uh, Don't worry. So thank you again to everybody. Uh, I really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, enjoy the rest of the London Design Festival and, and good evening to you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you and thank cheers. You.